One of the most frequent things that you do in your IT journey is login to remote servers. In this video, I will tell you basics of SSH, how to log into a remote Linux system over SSH, what is a server host key and why it's used, how to use SSH keys to authenticate, how to protect your SSH private key, how to make your life easier with authentication agent, and how to use a jump host. Please make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content. Hi, my name is Filip. Today we'll continue with our Linux tips for beginners. In order to log in to a remote Linux system, you should use the SSH command followed by the username and IP of the target server. If your local username matches the remote username, you don't have to specify the username at all. Optionally, you can specify the target port if the remote server is not listening on default 22 TCP. Upon initial connection, you will be asked to accept the remote server host key and presented with the server's public key fingerprint. The host key represents the server identity. You need to either trust it for the first time or obtain the fingerprint using some other means like contacting the remote server admin. Host key will be stored in known host file under .ssh folder in your home directory. Known host file stores each server's host key in a separate line. File format is pretty simple. Hashed IP address of the target server, host key algorithm, and the host key itself. In order to identify which line in known host files belong to a particular target server, you can use SSH keygen command. We can also check the host key of the remote server with the SSH keyscan command. As you can see, our host key stored in known host file matches to what the server presented. So next time you connect, SSH will do exactly that. Compare if the host key of the remote server matches to what is stored in the known host file. But why go to all the trouble? This process prevents man-in-the-middle attack. It's a type of attack where traffic goes via a system that the attacker controls, so the client connects to a rogue server thinking that it connects to the real one. Rogue server intercepts the traffic from the client and passes it to the real target server. It's extremely important not to proceed with the connection if the host key changed. It can indicate that you are not connecting to the system that you want to connect to. Here's a sample of what you get if the remote host key changed. Of course, it's also possible that the target server did reinstall the operating system. If that happens and you are sure that host key change was planned, then you need to remove the previous host key from your known host file, either manually or with SSH keygen command. Just to recap, upon initial connection, you will be given a remote host key. Once approved, host key will be stored in known host file in .ssh folder in your home directory. On every subsequent connection, remote server host key will be checked against what's stored in your known host file, preventing man-in-the-middle attacks. Do not connect to the remote system if host key changed. If you are absolutely sure, please remove the old host key and new will be added upon next connection. You can check remote host key with SSH keyscan command. Although password authentication is quite popular, a much more secure and convenient option is key-based authentication. Here you can find a movie where I explain that in more detail. Like the server host key identifies the server towards the client, user SSH key identifies the user towards the server. With key-based authentication, you generate a key pair with SSH keygen command and plant your public key on the remote system with SSH copy ID. With this approach, you don't have to provide a password every time you connect to the server. Moreover, keys are much more secure than passwords from a cryptographic perspective. What if the attacker obtains your private key? Will he be able to log into the remote system? Absolutely. So how to prevent that from happening? You can password protect your private key. This will cause your private key to be encrypted. Every time you want to use it, 
authenticate to the remote system, you will be prompt for the password to unlock the private key. In order to protect your private key with password, you either have to generate it from scratch, you'll be asked for a password then, or you can add the password to an existing key with SSH keygen p command. Same command allow you to change the password in the future. Now, if you try connecting, you'll be prompt for a password. Just to recap, it's recommended to use key-based authentication whenever possible and disable password authentication completely. Adding a password to your private key adds additional layer of protection. If the key gets compromised, it will be much more difficult to use it. You can add or change the passphrase for an existing key with SSH keygen command. By switching to key-based authentication, you made the authentication much more secure. However, you still need to enter the password every time you connect. If the connection happens multiple times a day, it may be challenging to type the password over and over again. There's a simple solution to that. It's called an SSH authentication agent. It's a process running in the operating system that stores your key in memory for further use. Here's how to enable it. This will start the SSH agent and set two environment variables. One holding the process ID and the other holding a socket used to communicate with the agent. Initially, the agent does not store any keys. In order to load a key, you need to use SSH add command. If you don't provide which key to load, then all your private keys from .ssh folder will be loaded. Obviously, you'll be asked to unlock the key. Now, your private key is stored in memory with the agent. You can check which keys are loaded with ssh add l command. Upon authentication, SSH will grab the private key from the agent. With that set, you don't have to type the password to your private key anymore as long as the agent is running. Please mind that SSH client knows how to talk to the agent by checking those two environment variables. If you close the session and open it again, those environment variables will not be set, so you have to set them again. Best practice is to kill the agent at the end of your work, so nobody can abuse it. Just to recap, if you don't want to type password for your private key every time you connect, you can use SSH agent that will load and store your keys in memory. Upon authentication, the agent will be used to obtain the key. Please kill the agent once you finish your work. Let me show you one nice benefit of using authentication agent. Let's imagine you have a server inside a secure network that you cannot access directly. You need to go via a bastion host or a jump server. In other words, you log into the bastion host first and then log in from there to your target server. This is a common practice to limit the potential surface of attack. If you'd like to use key-based authentication all the way, you'd have to plant your public key on the bastion host, but it will get you only that far. Once you are at the bastion host, you need yet another key pair to reach the target server. You can either generate a new key pair or use an existing one. Let's say we use the existing one. I will copy the keys from the source system to the bastion host. Now let's plant the public key from the bastion host to the target server to get key-based authentication working. Voila! Now you can log in from the source system to the bastion host and later to the target system, all using the same key. Only thing is, you did copy your private key to the bastion host. Private key should be private. You should not copy it anywhere. Now the trick. You can add your public key from the source system to both the bastion host and the target server. Both bastion host and remote server have the client's public key. Let's start SSH agent and add the key. We just use SSH A command to log into the Bastion host. Upon authentication, the Bastion host will reach the SSH agent. We know that already. However, once you try connecting from the Bastion host to the remote server, connection to the authentication agent will be forwarded to the client, allowing you to authenticate with your original key. You no longer have to copy your private key anywhere. It's stored securely on your 
client machine. Moreover, you can use the same public key on both servers. Let me show you. Neither remote server nor the bastion host have any keys. The keys are only on the client machine and to be precise, on the SSH agent. Similarly, you can connect to a remote server with authentication forwarding enabled and clone a private GitHub repository. You don't need your private key on the remote server as the local authentication agent will reach through the existing SSH connection and transparently authenticate with GitHub. Let me show you that. I'm on the client and I can clone the repository. Let me log into the remote server that does not have any keys. Here, cloning will fail. Now, let's enable the agent, add the key, and SSH with forwarding enabled. Cloning works. Because Bastion hosts and Jump servers are so popular, there is a dedicated parameter of SSH-J that allows you to make the connection to the target server by first making the connection to the Jump host and then doing TCP forwarding from there. It's considered more secure than agent forwarding because the attacker cannot contact the authentication agent in this scenario. Let me show you how it works. As in the previous example, you don't need any keys on the Jump host. Moreover, you don't even need an SSH agent running. It will use the keys from the source server.